Dr. Prateek Gauri, first of all, congratulations for being the fastest unicorn in a very short span of 11 plus months. Uh, you become a unicorn, you just raised $100 million. Uh, give us a sense of how has been your journey until here and where you're headed. Um, so first of all, it's an honor and privilege to be here. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, so the journey has been, you know, very, very exciting. Um, and uh, it's, it, I would like to call it an adventure uh, because we started our journey in August uh, last year. When we started a journey, so it's a, so five IRE, which stands for the fifth intervention is a concept that I've been personally promoting for 15 years to prove the thesis that you can actually make more money if you do it to the world. From the age of 16. From the age of 16. Yeah. So sustainability can actually define profitability at a point in time where most of the people I found out because I came from a humble family. So I uh, wanted to work at the intersection of both these circles because I saw that most of the people were either centered on profits and the rich were focused on charity, but there wasn't, there weren't a lot of people working at the intersection of both. So I found out that I'm going to build businesses around uh, the intersection of both these pieces, which I'm going to call the industrial revolution, where I'm going to try to prove the thesis that you can actually make more money if you do more with the world. For instance, if you run an electric vehicle business, it can be better than running a coal business. Geothermal is going to take, uh, is going to be better. Having 50% women in your workforce, for instance, is going to be better for organizations. So stuff like that. And I built eight businesses before I started founded Fire, all of them around the same theme. My last company, Fifth Element Group, ended up becoming one of the world's biggest impact consultancies. Um, so it was also working with Fortune 500 to prove the same message. But I found myself at an inflection point last year where I was like, how I was able to impact tens of millions of people, generate tens of millions of dollars through my previous companies, but I wasn't able to hit a billion uh, people mark because I knew the moment we think about a billion people, it's all automatically a billion dollar company. So you don't have to think of valuations or revenue if you're focused on building something for the community. So how do you reach a billion people quickly was the question I asked myself last year. And the answer was blockchain. And the answer was working at the intersection of blockchain and sustainability. So that's when uh, how the idea of FIRE started again, standing for the fifth industrial revolution. I was sitting at a chai shop uh, in Delhi. Uh, there's a chai shop called uh, Apni Chai next to Marriott with my other co-founder. His, his name is also Pratik, by the way. Uh, he, was, he just came from Barcelona. I just came back from the US. And we decided on a tissue paper that uh, we want to impact a billion people. So then bold, we wrote the end goal is to impact a billion people positively. Sustainability should define profitability. We're going to do it through blockchain because blockchain has the power to give the, it gives power to the community. Now then started what I'm going to do with it. So we figured out in the blockchain space, the biggest problem has been that they've been using two types of consensus. So um, by consensus, what I mean, any, so think of us, what Google did in web one or what Facebook did in web two, we're trying to do similar stuff in web three, where we are trying to curate a world, which is not only more abundant, but also more green through blockchain. Now blockchain had been using two types of consensus, whether it's Ethereum or Solana. First consensus is called proof of work. Now proof of work basically means that you have to spend more computational power to get the block rewarded to yourself. So if you have more computers, I have less computers, you get the block to yourself means you make money, but at the cost of spending more energy. So that means you can never be energy efficient. Second consensus very widely used was proof of stake, which basically means that you have to stake more money to get the block rewarded to yourself. So if you have more money than me, then you get the block rewarded to yourself, which means you make more money, which takes you back to the traditional finance problems that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So you're never able to solve the problem of financial inclusion where one and a half billion people have been left out of credit and banking. And a big piece that the, a big piece of the puzzle that blockchain is trying to solve is financial inclusion because it wants to give the power back to the community and it wants to go away from the centralized structures or the central power structures that the world has come uh, come towards with, with, with the progress of the fourth industrial revolution. So we decided at the chai shop that we're going to have a new consensus, which is going to be called proof of fire or proof of benefit, where we are going to embed sustainability or 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So people who don't know SDGs, they're basically a matrix defined by the United Nations. The SDG 3, for instance, stands for um, health. SDG 4 stands for education. SDG 5 stands for gender equality. SDG 6 stands for clean water and sanitation. SDG 13 stands for energy. How, how about we embed all those 17, tokenize them, put them into consensus, 
and scrape data from 650 ESG sources, environmental social governance courses, to come up with the world's first mathematical model, which not only measures sustainability, but rewards behavior of stakeholders financially. Now, the way the consensus that we've built works is if you, for instance, use geothermal and I'm using coal, so there's a weighted average, you get a score specific for that practice. If you have 50% women in your workforce, I have 20%, you get more points. But it doesn't, it, it doesn't discount the fact that you have money. Huh? So basically, we, we've kept nominated proof of stake also. So, but we have added a layer on top, which is the sustainability layer called proof of benefit. And the total and the sum comes up to be proof of fire. So the way our blockchain works is very unique and different. And that's our secret sauce also. That we are going to curate a world with a layer one infrastructure like a Google in the Web3 space, where any decentralized protocol that is built on top of the infrastructure, whether it is a government or a corporate, when they use our infra, they will help move the world from the current age of fourth industrial revolution, which has been following a for profit paradigm, to the age of fifth industrial revolution, which will follow a for benefit paradigm. So, ideally, transitioning the world from for profit economy to a for benefit economy. Now, it looks great on paper, of course, sounds good also, how do we do it? So we spent months on research, we wrote research papers, and after that, we started building technology. So we started building a team. In August, we started a journey. Uh, in in uh, October, three months after we started with a seven-member team, three co-founders and four others who joined us, we raised our first round of $21 million at $110 million valuation. So that was the first seed round. Uh, after that, we started building more technologies and we started testing our product. So we tested with, because our end goal is to impact a billion people, our goal was also to work with stakeholders, which have the ability to help us get adopted towards a billion people. So that meant governments and Fortune 500s and corporates. So we started working with, say, Government of India on, we started bringing the Muzaffar Nagar police in, in UP on the blockchain. So we tested multiple use cases with them, whether it's FIRs on blockchain, whether it's bringing all the employee records on blockchain, whether it's trying to make them go paperless, whether it's trying to bring arms licensing on blockchain, uh, whether it's smart policing, predictive policing, so then we tested the same piece in the US with the Nebraska police. So it's city of Alliance in the state of Nebraska in the, in the US. Then we did, tried and tested with uh, the government of Nigeria. So we tried and tested with governments. Then we started testing with corporates. We've tied up with Intex. They're entering the whole Web3 space through us. We tied up with Vijon, um, FMCG company, uh, again, based out of India. Then we tested with Eagle Hunters, which are about 120,000 employees to basically bring all their employee records on the, on the chain. Um, and the employee records on the chain, the thing is, so basically currently, so if you hire an employee today, how do you validate if they really uh, are what they claim to be? Meaning if they say they went to say a Harvard business school eight years back, how do you validate it? It takes you months or, you know, it takes you time to validate it. So it's very easy for employers to now validate it. If all the employee records stay on the chain, you can be validated. We're trying to get all the degrees, for instance, on the blockchain, all the academic credentials on the blockchain. We are building a decentralized identity solution for government to, to do it. We'll enter the CBDC space also. Uh, we want to bring the financial system on the chain, which lends more transparency, accountability, and trust. So there are multiple use cases that we tried and tested. So from November until now, we were just testing, testing, testing. Testing. Our mainnet is supposed to go live in November this year. And just about a few uh, days back, I think four or five days back, we, we closed our Series A round, which was a 100 million injection um, from uh, Estra Membram, which is a UK based uh, billion dollar conglomerate at a one and a half billion dollar valuation, making us one of the first companies to actually be a billion dollars pre revenue. Uh, not many companies have been able to do it, which I think I'm very proud of because. It's, it's basically shows that the world is now starting to believe that sustainability will actually be profitable because the valuation we got was basis 12 patents that we have. So four we have done and eight are pending. So it means that people know that this is going to be hugely profitable. And I've been in the space for 15 years and I can tell you 10 years back, nobody believed in it. Uh, we started hosting summits at the United Nations where we used to call 150 wealthiest families. Nobody believed in the idea that if you work around ESGs, you can actually make so much money. But now our, our uh, expected revenues which are in three years going to be like a billion dollars in revenue, which of course is the next goal also, is, is basically was, was agreed to by audit houses, by, by people who audited us. So basically it's really 
great to see that the world also wants to go in a direction where, and I think you were also saying blockchain web three is the future when we are chatting over China now. So it's it's basically people who are starting to believe, and right now the investors are starting to believe, entrepreneurs are starting to believe. It won't take long where masses, everybody starts to believe in the idea, and actually sustainability starts defining profitability, and you see more ventures in the fifth industrial revolution space. So my next goals would be to actually once we get our main net live in November, where we start generating revenue. Also, we want to work with hundred stakeholders next year, uh, meaning large corporates and and companies and um, and governments to bring them on the blockchain, um, and and uh, make a mark in the Web three space. We also want to make sure that India becomes the epicenter uh, where blockchain gets adopted. So that's another goal. Our another goal is to go from a billion dollar valued company, which I don't think is that big a deal, to a billion dollar revenue generating company um, where uh, in three years. So we have uh, we have a task ahead, which is way bigger than what we've done. So so that's. Those are the next goals. We're a team of about 105 people. We want to increase the strength to 150 very, very quickly now. Um, so those are some of the next steps. Pratik, uh, I got to know about you in in November last year, and I got to know about your company in November last year. This is your ninth company. You did eight more enterprises before you done this. What are your learnings from doing uh, nine companies? or this is the ninth, eight companies before the age of 30. I think the biggest learning that I've received is um, if you believe in yourself, the world will believe in you. And most of the people like us who come from, you know, humble background, I have so many friends who wanted to start when, but they never started ventures because their parents did not want them to start. Look, I'll be honest that when I was young, even my parents wanted to me to either become a bureaucrat or uh, because my one of my brothers is a bureaucrat, uh, either to become a bureaucrat or to uh, get into an IT and get into an IM. That's the way parents think and there's nothing wrong with it. So if you want to challenge the notion, I think it comes, it, it it's not easy where you have to challenge your parents first and then challenge your friends and relatives and everybody. And we face that in fire also because most of the, not only me, I think our uh, initial, all the 50 employees till actually media uh, started covering us. It was basically a challenge for them because they left their high lucrative jobs because we weren't paying people very highly uh, until we raised our rounds. So it was a challenge for them to come join us and, and convince their parents and families and girlfriends and boyfriends and whoever to actually that this is going to be the future and work with us. So I think the first thing is to have belief in yourself because I personally seen of having built, this is my ninth company that if you really believe in yourself, then the world will believe in you. It will take time. So you have to be very perseverant. I think perseverance is the key. Uh, we were crazy hours. So perseverance is actually the key. It will so still now, you know, even after reaching this, I still think a lot of people still will not believe in us. But, you know, if you keep building, 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 then one point comes where everybody knows that ye to nahi wala. So you have to believe. So, you know, and then people start believing in you. And that's when you actually to actually achieve what you've said to achieve. And nothing is impossible because I think I was telling you the story also when I was young, my, I was, um, and uh, I tell this story to all my friends and all the people who are with me. Uh, I think I am wherever I am just because of my friends and people and parents who have supported us because they've supported me so much. And the journey started, then my journey, because I came from a humble family. I was, I went to a mall in, in East Delhi, which is called the East Delhi Mall. Um, I don't know if it still exists though, but uh, uh, so, you know, the way malls have built, like, so ground floor is the most expensive stores. First floor is a little, second is a little cheaper and third is food court, right? So when I was young, that's when my mom took me to a mall. So I said, I'm going to shop from the ground floor. And uh, my mom said that, you know, no, 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 that is reserved for Ambani's kids. So it really stuck my head that how is that possible? Why is it only for them? And then I did all my research and I found out that this is the way pyramid works. It's the bottom billion where I am. Then there is rich people's kids. So I obviously can't go in that. And then above it, there's like top 100, 500 people who've actually become self-made billionaires and they've really impacted the world, whether it's uh, whether it's Jeff Bezos or most of the people who you now I, I, like Vijay Shekhar Sharma or so many people that I personally look up to or get inspired by that they've made it themselves. So we can go there, right? So it's not like you can't, but you have to stay. You have It takes you time. It takes a lot of energy. But if you believe in yourself, you reach there. So I think that really stuck to my head. And I thought I have to prove it to everybody that we can do it. So that started the journey. What is the risk associated with building you? 
somebody like Mr. Ammani decides to do this, right? And you know, when they decide to do something, they find ways to do it at scale, right? What could be the risk? I've given you one risk. Uh, they have all the connectivity, they have all the money, they have all the support system to be able to build. They may, they may not be another Pratik Kauri, but somebody who understands blockchain and they bring that person to build what you're building. So tell me, what could be the risk to your journey? So there's, of, of course, a lot of risk with big houses coming in. But I like to say one thing. Uh, you can't make a baby in less than nine months. So it's not possible, even if you're an Amani. So uh, we've taken a long time to build the technology. Uh, the techno the, the, we have a team of 65 tech folks who work 24-7 to help us go where we are. So even if somebody enters this space now, they need time. You can't buy time with money. So I think that's going to be... You've seen what happened in Maharashtra and politics, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? What if someone makes an offer to your complete team? No, actually, even if they do it, we have the whole service with ourselves. So the technology still stays with us. It's patented. So the whole patent stays with us. We have the IPs. So even if you go take the team, we can bring the whole, we can revamp the whole team. I'm not, I only wish you luck. I'm just asking. <laughs> no, you. no, I completely get it. Like it's a, it's a great question you're asking. What I'm saying is we intentionally, in fact, I'll tell you the goal we have, we cannot even achieve that goal without the help of large corporate houses or without the help of government. Let's be honest about it. We might have built an amazing technology, but it's useless until it's adopted. So for adoption, we need support of them. And in that whole journey, it's a win-win. So that's not a win-lose. It's a win-win for people, first of all, because people get the advantage of the technology. It's a win for us because the technology is adopted and that's basically our dream, uh, which we'll realize. And it's dream for all the corporate houses because they end up saving so much of cost that what they're saving and they end up making so much money. So it's basically a win-win for uh, uh, stakeholders, fire and people. So I don't think uh, that's going to be a problem. It's actually going to be- We wish uh, you luck. Uh, now let me focus on, uh, you focused until now to raise money. It's required for developing technology. It's required for go-to market. And it also, in some way, helps you Uber scale up, right? Very fast scale up. Tell me, uh, what is your advice to entrepreneurs who are raising money? Uh, the the promise of blockchain is such that it can revolutionize every domain, industry, application. Uh, give us a sense of what is your advice. So blockchain, and also uh, you will agree, Pratik, that anything that has a the power of unknown, the power of, you know, there is a novelty value and on that novelty value, you can raise whatever you have to. But some of the entrepreneurs in this room may be in sectors uh, which may not have that much on novelty value. They may be addressing an issue in a new way and finding solutions. How do they scale up? How do they raise capital? I think um, first thing I've realized you should never go to the market to raise money until you have um, a POC done. So basically, otherwise, there is no point because you'll end up giving a lot of equity for the money you bring and the money is going to be not enough for you to build the company, whether it's any sector. That's one learning that I, I got. But the second big one is that if you really um, have, uh, for instance, I, I mean, if you talk about blockchain, of course, we we know that the novelty factor, as you mentioned, is so high that one piece of valuation actually comes from the novelty factor. But if you are, so we are not a crypto company, we're a blockchain web three company. So if you, so crypto, if you're doing crypto, then there is a lot of ups and downs because the market is really volatile. So right now you can't raise money if you're a crypto entrepreneur, basically it's very hard to raise money, but blockchain as a technology, it's here to stay. It's web three is the future and everybody recognizes it. So, but still, I think investors are now starting to realize that they're not going to, not going to give you money until they see your product actually going live and being adopted. Adopted. So now, for instance, as I mentioned in this round before that, we clearly showed POCs with multiple governments and multiple Fortune 500 companies or multiple corporates, which basically shows, gives them a sense that once the technology is actually live in November, there's huge revenue expected. So the big part of the valuation also comes from our patents. And the second comes from the fact that we'll be an actual revenue, a billion dollar revenue generating company with a lot of profits. 
so we're not going to be read on the balance sheets for all our life, which a lot of startups are. So I think now if you are running a startup, whether it's it is agnostic of your sector, if it's going to be read for a long, long time, gone are the times when you're going to get funding. Uh, you need to start thinking about profitability from day one. It's not like you're going to be profitable from day one. Of course, you need money to build. But unless you show that that money is going to help you become profitable, I don't think uh, you're going to be able to raise a lot of money. So I think that's my sense, two cents. Okay, uh, Pratik, uh, if I talk to you three years from now, what would have fire five IR achieved? What would have Pratik Gauri achieved? So I would like. I know you have audacious goals. I uh, I heard from you uh, over chai when we were sitting downstairs. But I'd like the audience to know what your audacious goals are. I think if we you can... Know, there are not many people I meet. I meet a lot of people of various diverse background, diverse areas that they're trying to change. But I don't use the word, the word that people want to change the world. But I think in Pratik's case, he's literally trying to change the world because the way he's trying to implement blockchain technology in every part of our everyday being could change the world. So that's why I'm asking that, what are your audacious goals for the audience? I think the one of the biggest audacious goals is to um, help achieve financial inclusion for the masses. So there were, as I mentioned, the whole world, there are one and a half billion people who left out of banking. So <clears throat> we want to give them access to um, access to credit. We want to give them access to financial um, uh, uh, authority to take decisions which they've been left out so that's one big uh, one big thing that we're trying to do we are going to help move the world as i mentioned to for benefit paradigm where we want to actually so right now i'm at the, on the stage today saying that sustainability is going to define profitability in three years from now if i can find you know thousands of startups in the fifth industrial revolution space where they're all collectively saying that sustainability is profitable we've raised money for it and now we have built it and we are profitable even if it's a little bit of profit in three years from now, I think that's what I would say that would be success for us because it's the start of a new revolution which can really change lives. It can bring happiness on you don't know how many how many faces because people don't like our goal is to basically solve social problems through blockchain. And when I say social problems, I use the word sustainability, which is synonymous to the 17 SDGs. So like health, climate, renewable, solar. If you see geothermal going ahead, renewables, electric vehicles we were just talking about. So right now going away from traditional cars to EVs. If those are the transitions that can happen in the next three years, empowered by blockchain, I think that's I would call success for us. You know, uh, Pratik, you also mentioned to me that the money you raise, some bit of it, you may use to acquire startups that help you in your mission or you will help them in their mission and intertwine that with what you do. So give us a sense of what kind of areas and what kind of startups are you looking to find synergies with? Yeah, so any startup now, which is in the Web3 space, uh, working at the intersection of blockchain and sustainability. So it doesn't need to be just layer one. So we are a layer one, it can be a layer two. Uh, but if they're trying, if they align with the thesis of the fifth industrial revolution, that they believe that sustainability is going to define profitability and they're building any decentralized protocol, which can actually be decentralized, but at the same time, empower the community in a sustainable way, not harming the climate i think we would be very open to investing whether it's a merger or an acquisition uh to make sure that we as a group collectively in three years are helping move the world where we want it to be where we curate a world which is not only abundant but more green absolutely and you know i was reading the last issue of time not the current uh, it is on environment london has had 40 degree temperature arjun london is crazy right now. yeah there have been fires in europe uh, Donald Trump said, you know, environment is a hoax. Uh, I, you know, clearly he has to eat his words. Not that we take Donald Trump and what he says very seriously. Uh, but uh, coming back to you, Pratik, uh, a lot has been said about a uh, lot of startups that raised money, became big. Uh, and you've said that earlier that you want, you're targeting revenue and, you know, your whole focus is to be a profitable uh, enterprise and make an impact. But uh, six months back, in the last six months, the mood has changed. But six months back, the only thing that mattered was how much money you raised. What is your valuation? 
When are you going to do your next round? Nobody was talking of sustainability of the enterprise. Nobody was talking of revenues. Nobody was talking of making sure uh, that valuations are a byproduct of value and not an end by itself. So what do you have to say that to that? I think, uh, look, uh, there was last year, if I talk about the blockchain market also, right? So there was, as I said, there was a lot of infusion of cash last year, crazy infusion of cash by VCs. But then they suddenly realized that this is not sustainable because no company has, a lot of companies haven't generated money yet. So that's why I'm saying now we have come at an inflection point, uh, even in the Web3 space, which is still very innovative. So it's relatively easier to raise money, let's be honest. But it's come at an inflection point where you can't raise money unless you um, show uh, revenues coming in into the system. That's why I said without a POC and without revenues, you can't, it's very hard for you to raise big money. And that's why when we went for this round, we were very clear that we're going to do 10 POCs or 10 pilots and show that this can, when this 10 becomes 100, this is the money we are expecting. So that's a huge piece uh, that goes into raising your next round. So, and to your question, a uh, lot of companies have done this and a lot of VCs have also done this because if you come in as a seed and if you exit at series B, then you do make money, right? As an investor. But the point is, what about the last person coming in? So there's going to be somebody losing, right? But if you're a revenue generating company, then nobody loses, everybody wins. And the most importantly, the people win. Uh, so the product is built for the community and the masses. And if they win, then uh, there's no question that investors and the entrepreneurs are definitely going to win. So I think focus should be on the people. Uh, Seek, I'll ask you my last two questions. Enough has been said about the culture of startups. We saw what happens with, with a certain fintech company. We saw what happens with a fashion tech company in Singapore and their founders. What do you have to say about the culture at startups? What are the positives and what are areas where startups can improve in their culture? I think um, when you are, I think in your journey as a startup, you need to realize that there are, there's going to be transitions. Uh, if you're growing very fast, there are going to be transitions every six months. So like we used to, we call it fire 1.0, fire 2, internally, it's not external, but we call it internally fire 1.0, fire 2.0 and fire 3.0. We have currently entered fire 2.0. So when we started building company, I was, I'm be very honest, most of the people, there were, on low salaries, high ESOPs. And we made sure that they're compensated in the form of ESOPs because we did not have enough cash. And we made, we asked them that, you know, you believe in the vision. So they were working very long hours. But when you grow as a company after now, when we are now a team of more than hundred, we'll soon be a team of 150. You can't expect everybody to work almost weekends or, or, you know, so a lot of founders actually mistake that and they don't appreciate or they don't, they're very hard for them to transition from the 1.0 to 2.0 where they all uh, think that everybody's going to think like themselves and everybody's going to work like you, but that's not going to happen. Um, so I think that's a big, big piece that you need to realize that there needs to be a transition. I think the second is the culture should be more like to follow is like a family culture. So I'm anyways not married, so I don't know. This is my family, right? So, so I think it's a family culture here. Um, How many children do you have? So that's what I'm saying. No, no, no children, no family. You don't have to be married to have children. children. I must... Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm Indian. No, so. Okay. Oh, you're Indian. <laughs> so I'll be true to India. Uh, I'm, very I'm married and have two kids. I'm married <laughs> to the same woman for 22 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's because you're Indian also. <laughs> I'm a happy Indian. Yeah, happy Indian. So, yeah, so I think uh, it's what we have followed, which has worked for us thus far, has been the fam uh, It's creating a family where we not only in the reviews will discuss just the KPIs or the sheets, we'll also discuss how well you are personally, how's your wife doing, how's your husband doing, how's your kids doing, all of that. I think which you forget when you are just running after KPIs because startup life is hard. There's no doubt about it. You have to work, you have to slog, you have to hustle. Um, there's only always going to be pressure, but that doesn't take away from you, your emotional or your human side. If you give away your human side, I think then you, you can never build a fortune 500 company. You might reach a stage. BW 500 also. <laughs> yeah, BW, BW 500. 500. Indian, yeah. Indian. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I hope that we are able to be called business world. We're able to take it outside India next year and license our brand and our business. But 
that's an item that I have. My last question. What are your personal goals five years from now? Personal goals, I think it still remains the same. I haven't been able to realize that. I hope I realize it in five years. At 16, I saw the same dream that I want to impact 1 billion plus people positively and see smiles on people's faces, which I haven't been able to realize yet. And that's why I built fire. Uh, so I hope in five years, we're able to realize dream that I saw when I was a young child. Okay. Um, I have Dr. Victoria amongst us. It's time to ask him some questions. So please raise your hand. Tell us who you are. How much is your bank balance and your question? <laughs> <laughs> the last one is very important. Yeah. The question of the bank balance. No, bank balance. Okay. Good to ask. Good to ask. So bank, so with the way you're working, <laughs> banks will be out of work soon. You know, <laughs> what's happening. But yes, the gentleman here, can you get in the mic? Uh, business world team, if you haven't gone for your afternoon siesta, uh, this is the longest that takes to get a mic. You should get an award for getting a mic so slow. I have seen it across the last two days. We'll institute an award and give it to you, sir. And to the event manager managing. You can just talk. I hope the next mic comes fast, otherwise I'll throw my mic at you. Yeah, hi. It was uh, wonderful to listen to you. So the environment, you said sustainability. What is, is your name? What do you I'm you sorry. I'm I'm uh, just at a uh, startup, which is pre-revenue and at the prototype stage. So I'm trying to bring in a, a sort of revolution in construction, bringing in fastest construction in the world. If, so I, my question to you is, when you say sustainability, do you mean environmental sustainability or business sustainability? So I, first of all, I meant all types of sustainability and you missed one big one. So environment sustainability is not the only. So when I say sustainability, I, uh, I offer, I mean, I'm, I count it synonymous to the 17 SDGs, which basically means you are compliant on the number of women you hire. You are compliant on uh, not polluting the environment. You are not just energy efficient, but you basically help achieve all SDGs, which, whether it's health tech businesses, whether it's your, you are working around education, whether you're working around climate, whether you're working around energy, whether you're working around geothermal, whether you're working around solar. And um, so all of that taken into account is what I call uh, sustainability. Now, on the other hand, of course, uh, another one is financial stability, but that's internal to us, meaning like we want to be sustainable financially and not dependent on external funding for a long time. So for all. Great. So the housing sector, this suffers from a lack of about a billion houses all over the world. So there's your billion, billion uh, uh, houses, there's impact for you, which will impact at least four people, every house, four to five people. So literally the whole of humanity can be uh, impacted by introducing uh, a reachable fast track, uh, a 21st century uh, building uh, construction technology to the masses, to the world. So I would like to speak to you in private regarding that. Thank you. Next question. So I want to know about regarding this blockchain, the two months back, uh, finance minister, she said if there is an inherent risk in the blockchain and people should be in precaution on this. You so know, I I, let me say, I remember her. She said in the context of crypto, she did not say, let me say blockchain is a technology, right? Matchbox, it's a matchbox. You can light a, a prayer uh, Dia with it, or you can put fire to this hotel. I, mean, I'm just, I hope I'm not planting this seed in somebody's mind. This is Anurag Bhatra told me to do this. So again, that's up to you, but I'm sure you've grown up. Uh, so blockchain is a technology, right? If you learn how to code, you can use that coding to hack into some places and do wrong things, right? That doesn't, the issue is about, she was talking in the context of crypto. She's not talking. Blockchain is being used by the largest companies in the world to change the way they do business. Okay. Mercedes is using globally in a big way. All big. I met a guy who's put $2 billion in India in December 2019. And I asked him, what should I do if I have to? He said, become a product, editorial product that reports on blockchain. And since then, I became a student of blockchain. So I can tell you, blockchain's applications are mind blowing. I don't don't use the word mind blowing in a very light sense. Okay, it it decentralizes, it democratizes, 
uh, it reduces cost, it reduces energy consumption. Correct. Though blockchain by itself, in the you know the, the levels he talks about, is about resources. It's about compute resources. Correct. I met a startup from Hyderabad on Monday in Hyderabad. And they came to me because they are doing blockchain for ad tech fraud deduction. Yeah. And you yeah. know, and he he explained to me I he needed money. So I asked him, where will you deploy? So computing power. Correct. But again, so blockchain is a technology, its application can be anything else. Pratik, I congratulate for your vision. And I couldn't get uh, you said I want to impact one billion lives. In what way? Through your technology deployment to Correct. corporates or directly you are, you are going to impact their lives? No, employee uh, 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 adoption of technology through stakeholders and stakeholders when I mean like large stakeholders, whether it's governments or um, corporates or even developers building on top of us. So the next Ola's or the next, uh, like for instance, business world, if their content, the whole content they write comes on our blockchain, I would still count it as impact. So, I mean, it depends on how many decentralized applications are being built on top of our layer one infrastructure. That's one. Second is how many governments adopt us. Again, when they adopt us, it basically also means there are some use cases that we are running with them. So through that use case, if I run, say, FIR use case in UP, so there's certain amount of people which benefit out of it. So we'll have data for it. All that data combined means the billion people have benefited from adoption of our technology. That's what I mean. Yeah. And you know, again, the biggest impact comes from partnering with the government. If the government decides to take all its records on blockchain, imagine the impact, right? So you have to work with policymakers and government to make more impact. Of course, the private sector can also be a very large part of it. Yeah. So it's not either or. So. Hello. Hi, my name is Anup Pandey. And uh, I just wanted to talk. There is also some controversy about Web3. So maybe you can dwell either Nurag or you can dwell on it. And congratulations on what your- What was the controversy? I'm not aware. Uh, there are some big names. I, I, and I think Elon Musk is of course one name who is Who's dead Elon against Web3. Who's Elon Musk by the way? <laughs> Nobody, I, we know. know. Um, another thing is which are the other blockchain startups beyond fire, fire which you are uh, following or you would say, are doing some great work in the blockchain in India and world. So uh, when you say controversy, uh, most of the people who have come uh, and spoken about some of the pieces which blockchain is not able to solve was sustainability. So if you check, you'll find that. And that's the biggest problem that we have solved. Uh, so that is, uh, that is, I think that's the first part of your question. The second you asked about, so uh, two of the other blockchains, which I feel have done very well in terms of getting adoption, okay, uh, was Ethereum and Solana. They've done a very good job uh, on bringing a lot of the developers to start building on top of their chain. One thing that they did not do, which we are trying to also do, uh, not one, one many, uh, one is solve the uh, sustainability issue because we have changed the way consensus works because they've been mostly using either proof of work or proof of stake, which I think I explained. So they can never be sustainable. And that's the big reason why a lot of large stakeholders haven't adopted them. So it's mostly been developers. Uh, for us, the difference has been that we have taken a different route for go-to-market because we first solved the sustainability problem from, uh, from the bottom. And then now we're going to large stakeholders to ask them to adopt us. So that's one big, so uh, of course, if you want to ask me about competitors, they're obviously competitors. Um, then uh, another one is that we are way faster than most of the other technologies because our block size is very low. I don't want to get into technicals, but our block size is very low. Our gas fees is very, very low. So cost is very low when any large stakeholder adopts us. It's as low as one tenth of a cent. So you can compare it with a visa transaction. So even if you transfer $100 million, it costs you one tenth of a cent, which is very low. So yeah, so we tried to basically plug. So look, we have a big research team in-house and a big part of the research team where a lot of money is being deployed also after we receive funding is to make sure we stay ahead of the game in blockchain and Web3. Every six hours, I see there is a new thing that we can do. Uh, meaning six because... hours. Thank you so much for the session. My name is Fazil. I'm a part of Sketchmong and Eagle Care. I have a question. Uh, a recent case study which happened in Ethiopia where they use blockchain, you know, in financial services, they literally, you know, eradicated their banking problem. Do you think something like that will work in India? Because in India, I think a lot of people does not even have bank account. So do you think that will work? 
And if that is to work, do you see any challenges that you know you can you know, solve it or specifically when you work with government agencies and all those things? Do you see that? So look, it's still in exploratory phases. There's only two ways to do it. One is of course through CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency, which I think in this budget they already announced that they're looking at it. Uh they um, so they, it's going to come into play some some point or the other, whether it's next year or next to next year. I think CBDC will actually give uh, a lot of power to the masses because a lot of people who don't have access to bank accounts, if you have a decentralized identity system or a decentralized, uh, decentralized identity, DIS, how we call it, decentralized identity solution, then you can bring all of them and link their identity. They basically get identity. So that's the first uh, problem of the puzzle. The second problem is then get them uh, to register on the chain and educate them, right? Because they need to also learn. So there, it's going to take time. Look, um, I was reading in 1991, um, I was reading a newspaper, New York Times of 1991. It said there is a new fad in the market called the internet. And you know, internet became pervasive, not so quickly, it took time. So blockchain, everybody's realizing that it has the power to change the world, but let's also give it some time. So when it, we talk about CBDC changing the whole financial system of the whole 1.3 billion population, it's not going to happen overnight. It can't even happen in one year, two years. It'll take time. But it, the process is going to start, which is a great step towards the future, which I see already happening with this budget that they announced. So I think India will be the epicenter of a financial revolution, I feel, where the power is going to go back to the community, which is great. Uh, but I think it needs to happen from the government and from the central bank. And the reason I'll tell you, because there needs to be prevention of fraud also. Um, and a big part of why a lot of people have been very skeptical is because frauds can happen because there have been no regulation yet. So I would personally feel that there should be regulation. So if it happens from the government and CBDC, it can be white labeled or whatever, the technology can be built by us or whatever. But if it happens from the government level, then it actually is a very uh, foolproof uh, way of uh, getting the whole billion people on blockchain because you're talking about the whole billion people. But one that actually happens, it's going to be a time when you just ask the answer to your question is when that actually happens, then every person, every farmer or every, per, every poor person would also enjoy financial services which they, they, they've been left out. Hope you answered that question. We have one more minute left, so I'll ask the question. Pratik, uh... There's no work-life balance, you know, in life for entrepreneurs. Their work is their life, right? Tell me, in your case, is there a work-life balance? Luckily, you're single, so you and you don't know about any children also. So that also <laughs> between these two things, you have. But how do you? Is there something beyond work that you like doing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, adventures. So basically, um... we haven't got married yet. Yeah, but different type, it's a different type of adventure. Ask Arjun, huh? Arjun. <laughs> he's, he's, he's dealing with a good adventure at home. But, you know, yeah, he's had a lot of adventures. Yeah, yeah. But my adventures are different. Well, I love, um, I love excitement in my life, whether it's startups. So blockchain excites me. So the same way I would do scuba diving. I'm planning to learn never how to fly. You've never done scuba diving? I'll take Lots you. of things I've never done. No, skydiving. So I'm basically uh, getting a license of skydiving. So I've done two lessons. Uh, there are six more. Then I want to learn how to fly. Um, so that's another one. Um, so basically anything that is exciting, you know, which gives me chills. That's something I like. So I think that's what I do in whenever I find a little bit of time. But over the but also uh, work for us where the work kind of work we do is as good as you know, playing cricket. Like when I used, you know, when I was a kid, I used to love playing cricket. Right now, that's how much I love building uh, this Beautiful. company. Confucius said, if you make your hobby or profession, you don't have to work. Pratik Gauri is an example of that. He loves what he does and he's trying to change the world. So wish Pratik all the best. Give him a big round of applause for being such a sport and doing what he does. So we wish you luck and I'm sure We'll do many more conversations, both on stage and off stage. Thank you so much, Anurag, for having me. I just, we, we, whole team came just because we got to know about it yesterday. We didn't even know about this summit happening. We just got to know day before or yesterday. And we made sure we turn up because uh, I've known Anurag for a long time. We have, we met first time, but I've known about him. Uh, and he, he he's just a great job at uh, promoting or amplifying uh, entrepreneurs who are actually trying to do something in the world. And it really matters a lot to uh, me and other entrepreneurs. Thank you.